Welcome to worship with us this weekend at Grace Communion Melbourne and Grace Communion Orlando. And let me just say Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers out there, all of our grandmothers on this weekend. We're returning to the book of Job today in our sermon series. Victor Hugo once said, Tomorrow, if all literature was to be destroyed and it was left to me to retain one work only, I would save Job. And Daniel Webster pointed out that if only it's taken a mere work of literary genius, it's one of the most wonderful productions of any age or of any language. So this is a masterpiece of literature. Even for the non-Judeo-Christian mind, the book of Job stands out as an incredible piece of literature. In the New Testament, the Apostle James asks us to consider Job's life in the light of the godly patience at work in us. I'll read James 5 now because this is part of where we're going to be focusing today. James writes, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast or patient. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Through the book's many chapters in Job, all three of his friends prepare and deliver their arguments against him. And beginning in chapter 4 and ending in chapter 25, Eliphaz turns on Job quickly and puts the blame for his suffering squarely on Job himself, beginning in chapter 4. He says, Remember, who that was innocent ever perished? Or where were the upright cut off? As I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Job's second friend, Bildad, comes along and says almost the same thing. Behold, God will not reject a blameless man, nor take the hand of evildoers. And then, by the time Zophar speaks, he repeats the refrain, If iniquity is in your hand, put it far away, and let not injustice dwell in your tents. Surely then you will lift up your face without blemish. You will be secure and will not fear. And your life will be brighter than the noonday. Its darkness will be like morning. So Job answers each of these men as this pattern continues through the middle of the book of Job for three rounds. His friends speak and Job comes back. And in the final round, only Eliphaz and Bildad attempt to humble Job because by chapter 25, Zophar has dropped out of the race, tired of the argument altogether, and doesn't want any part of the conversation. They've tried to convince and convict Job that his suffering is directly attributable to his sin. Finally, they have nothing else to say to him and have not helped him. In fact, they've done some harm, and God reminds them at the end that they need to repent. In modern times, we call their approach a theology of retributive justice. Job's friends try to convince him that he has brought all this calamity upon himself, and the sooner he acknowledges it, the better. Their premise is that God always brings punishment to the wicked and blesses blessings to the good, both in the short run as well as the long run. And they hold the opinion that if something bad happens to someone, it must be because they did something bad. If something good happens, it must be because they did something good. Now, there is no doubt that sin causes suffering. And we see many examples in Scripture where God does send calamity as a punishment, as he did at Sodom in Genesis chapter 19. And in most situations in life, things turn out better when we follow God's ways than when we forsake them. However, God doesn't always work that way in every challenge and calamity or trial in a Christian's life. Jesus pointed out himself that our disaster is not necessarily a sign of God's judgment in Luke chapter 13. Here we find 18 men who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. And many who were present assumed these men had it coming, that in some way they had brought this calamity upon themselves. And so then Jesus poses this question to the audience. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So the accusations that Job's friends made were false. God called him an upright man in chapters 1 and 2. And Job is not perfect, but he's no spiritual lackey. They erred when applying a generalization to his situation without really knowing what they were talking about. 
Back before Easter in this series, we saw Job's friends coming from a wrong starting place. They misunderstood the kind of suffering he was experiencing and as a result came up with misguided solutions. His friends can't lament with Job or even acknowledge that they lack a basis for judging him. They turn to defending God by placing the blame on Job, which seems a bit self-righteous, thinking that God needs you or I to defend him against someone. Now in the New Testament we read that the apostles and the disciples defended the gospel, but God is completely capable of defending himself, and he does so when he speaks to Job out of the whirlwind and then addresses his friends as well after that. God himself rebukes them. He says to Eliphaz, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. So as the friends' speeches continue, their rhetoric becomes increasingly hostile. They work themselves into a logical, frenzied corner and now must blame Job or blame God. So they harden their hearts against their former friend. Eliphaz, by Job 22, is saying, there's no end to your iniquity. And he invents iniquity to charge Job with. He says, you've given no water to the weary to drink, and you've withheld bread from the hungry. You send widows away empty-handed and the arms of the orphans you have crushed. That's a pretty foul accusation for a man who did take care of those who lived in his community. But it doesn't have to be friends who accuse us. Unlike Job, most of us are quite ready to accuse ourselves as well. Anyone who's tasted failure has likely pondered, what have I done to deserve this? It's natural, not altogether incorrect, because sometimes either out of laziness or bad information or simply being over our head in a situation, we make poor decisions and that causes us to fail. However, not all failures are the result, direct result of our own shortcomings. Many are the result of circumstances outside our control. Jesus reminds his followers to expect some hardship, even some tribulation in our life and in our walk of faith to this day. Now, anyone who has spent time with a friend who's suffering knows how hard it is to be present without trying to give an answer. Someone you care about is trying to rebuild their life piece by piece without any certainty of outcome. And our instinct is to investigate what went wrong and identify a solution. In fact, we're wired that way. Then we imagine we can help our friend eliminate the cause and get back to normal as soon as possible. Because knowing the cause, at least we'll know how to avoid the same fate ourselves. And I think sometimes this is our hidden motivation. We ourselves don't want to get caught in the same situation, so we're desperately trying to help them find a solution as well. We would rather give a reason for the suffering, be it right or be it wrong, than to accept the mystery at the heart of suffering. Perhaps this is why the Apostle James reminds us in his book to be eager to listen, slow to speak, and even slower to become angry. Job's friends succumb to the temptation. They're not able to endure this mystery of suffering, so they jump to conclusions about its source in Job's life. Now, it would be foolish for you and I to imagine that we could never do the same thing with our own friends. Though well-intentioned, our quick Christian response to suffering may fall into the same category of words that Job's friends spoke. We might say, well, you know, it's all for the best. It's part of God's plan, you know. And sometimes we quote a scripture and apply it to their particular situation. God never sends more adversity than, than you can handle. How would we know what they could handle? God does, that's true. But how foolish to think we know the reason for anyone else's suffering. We don't even know the reason for our own suffering at times. It's more truthful and more helpful to admit, I don't know why this happened to you. No one should have to go through this. And if we can do this, and then remain present, we may become an agent of God's compassion. But now beginning in chapter 20, uh, 32, a fourth man speaks and his name is Elihu or Elihu. Let's go to Job 32. So these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then Elihu, the son of Bar Barakel, the Buzite of the family of Ram burned with anger he burned with anger at Job because he justified himself rather than God. He burned with anger also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, although they had declared Job to be in the wrong. Now, Elihu had waited to speak 
to Job because they were older than he. And when he saw that there was no answer in the mouth of these three men, he burned with anger. There's a lot of burning with anger going on in Elihu. And Elihu, the son of Barakel the Buzite, said, I am young in years, and you are aged. Therefore, I was timid and afraid to declare my opinion to you. I said, let days speak, and many years teach wisdom. But it is the spirit in man, the breath of the Almighty, that makes him understand. It is not the old who are wise, nor the aged who understand what is right. Therefore, I say, listen to me. Let me also declare my opinion. Behold, I waited for your words. I listened for your wise sayings while you searched out what to say. I gave you my attention, and behold, there was none among you who had refuted Job or answered his words. Beware lest you say, we have found wisdom. God may vanquish him, not a man. He has not directed his words against me, and I will not answer him with your speeches. They are dismayed. They answer no more. They have not a word to say. Remember, the conversation has dropped off and so far has dropped out. And I, shall I wait because they do not speak, because they stand there and answer no more? I also will answer with my share. I also will declare my opinion, for I am full of words. The spirit within me constrains me. Behold, my belly is like new wine that has no vent, like new wineskins ready to burst. I must speak that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. I will not show partiality to any man or use flattery toward any person, for I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. God's word for you and for me. Thanks be to God. So we should note that we're given Elihu's genealogy. Did you notice that in the first couple of verses? He's a descendant of Barakel, the, the Buzite. That is Buzz, Buzzite, <laughs> not Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> but the Buzz who's mentioned in Genesis as one of Abraham's forebearers, a son of Nahor, Abraham's grandfather. And when scripture gives us a genealogy on a person, it's a sign of importance. The other three friends did not receive a genealogical account in Job's book. So now Elihu begins to speak for six chapters. Only Job has a larger speaking role in the book, and even Yahweh's answer to Job's is shorter. While at first it seems that much of his speech is following along the lines of the other three, there is an important difference. Elihu is not rebuked. He's not rebuked by Job, as Job came back at his friends, nor by God. So how do we interpret him? How has he spoken truth to Job in a way that God does not condemn? Well, Job's three friends accused him of secret sin. If you'll just confess it, if you'll just admit what you've done, Job, this will be over. But Elihu doesn't say that. Instead, he rightly discerns that Job's suffering itself has led him into doubting God's goodness. And this is where repentance is needed. Job never cursed God to his face, but he did wrongly state that God had made him his enemy. Job 33 and verse 8, Surely you have spoken in my ears, and I have heard the sound of your words. You say, I am pure without transgression. I am clean, and there's no iniquity in me. Behold, he finds occasion against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks and watches all my paths. Elihu said, Behold, in this you are not right. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. It seems that in the midst of his suffering, Job's pride is being exposed. And this is why we often comment that there is a self-righteousness that is actually worked out of Job in the midst of his suffering that he didn't begin with. It was a trial. It was for spiritual growth. There is repentance called for, and Elihu's speech prepares Job for God speaking to him out of the whirlwind in Job 37 and verse 14. Elihu says, hear this, O Job, stop and consider the wondrous works of God. And then he begins to talk about the magnificent creator and creation, which prepares the way for God speaking to Job in the next chapters. Elihu speaks of God's hand in this as working in the suffering to deliver him. So in Job's life, we're given the unique opportunity to ask a couple of important questions of ourselves when we face any kind of suffering. Do I view myself primarily as a victim of trials 
walking through life a victim of one thing after another? Or do I see myself as a sinner in need of God's grace? Our biggest problem in this life is not suffering a trial, but sin. We live in a world that is quick to allow suffering to excuse sin. And as we look at the way the three friends of Job mishandled his situation, we are also mindful that our culture is at the other end of the suffering spectrum. We are so reticent to point out sin if there's any suffering already present. This is why God answers us all, if you will, in the book of Job, that we do dare to darken counsel without knowledge and trying to solve our own problems. Ever noticed how we're most likely to sin against someone when they're making our life difficult? Our angst and our anger makes it easier to treat that person without grace. I'm sure it was easier for Job to come back at those friends once they'd poked at him. Ever been in a car accident? It's someone else's fault. You step out of your vehicle. You're so calm and comforting. Is anyone hurt? Can I help in any way? Usually we step out of the vehicle. What were you thinking? Were you texting and driving again? When we've been hit and wronged. So in Job's life, we're given the opportunity to step back and look at our own struggles. Is my main concern to rid myself of all pain or to live in God's grace as a forgiven child of God? Elihu suggests that for the child of God, suffering is an education in righteousness and not punishment for sin. Listen to him in Job 36 and verse 8. And if they are bound in chains and caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions, that they are behaving arrogantly. He opens their ears to instruction and commands that they return from iniquity. In Job 36 and verse 15, Elihu goes further and says, He delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their ear by adversity. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction. God allowed the arrogance to come out of Job in the depth of his trial, and he was going to deliver him through it. Do we view our own suffering as the refinement of his righteousness and not punishment for sin? This is the kind of discipline the author of Hebrews holds out to us as part of God's love for his children. In chapter 12, he says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom receives. Notice verse 7 it is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And if you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. God has called us to holiness, not just a trial-free, suffering-free life. God's goal for you and for me is to share his holiness with us. And that does involve some adversity as he uncovers the parts of our lives that need to be rooted out like weeds in a good field. So the book of Job reminds us that we see ourselves in the face of Job's friends sometimes. We too, presumably, know right from wrong. We have some sense of God's ways, but we do not know all the way God is working and applying his will in all times and all places in someone else's life. As the psalmist declares, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. God's thoughts and his ways are higher than yours and, your, and mine. But we know that he's good and we learn to trust. God's ways are often a mystery beyond our understanding. How quickly do I pronounce ignorant judgments against my friends or my family or my coworkers? Let's pray about that. 
Gracious God, we thank you that you love us too much to leave us without discipline and guidance, that your mercy is evident even through our deepest trials. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And you call us friends and not enemies. You are not against us. Help us remember always that you are good, even when we're tempted to find blame. May the words of our mouths be encouraging to one another at times of loss and times of tragedy. May we do everything in word and in deed to your glory. And thank you for loving us. Thank you for wanting to share a better way and your holiness. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Here are benediction from Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all the church said, Amen. See you next week.